Can you both, in your own words, describe what the film is about? Michael? It's, uh, it's the story of, of an old man's journey uh, to Darwin to kill himself, and in doing so, he discovers what life's all about. Jeremy, is that a fair summation? Yeah, it's, it's pretty close. It's the, 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 uh, that idea of being awakened by events, by, by things that happen to you in your life, and that, that sometimes that might come right at the end of your life. Uh, and that, it's that story, the road trip. It's a road trip to discovery. Right. You talk about awakening. I'm very keen to know what both you guys learnt from the making of this film. <laughs> <laughs> Lots. Who do you want to do? You want to start? <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> you might actually get it. Um, um, look, well, in, in terms of the film, I mean, it was it was quite a, a grueling enterprise um, in terms of just the the physic, physicality of the shoot, and um, but at the same time, um, that very physicality sort of helped. So I, I suppose what you took on board during the shoot um, sort of sort of paid off in the performance in some way. I probably haven't mm. quite answered the question. It, but It was an Odyssean journey and it really, we did go through trials and tribulations on the way and, and because we got to shoot in sequence. And, yeah, now Michael got to build um, Rex's world and his life as we all travelled. On, on the road together, and, and, and all of us, all of us um, had an extraordinary kind of journey and adventure. Michael, it's an extraordinary performance. What do you think of the performance that you put in? Oh, look, I find it very hard to, to watch. I mean, you've seen the, the film as many times as I have, and uh, I don't really want to see it again um, because it, in some ways it's a bit like pulling the wings off butterflies. <laughs> Because you, the more you look at it, you don't see what's right with it. You start to see what's wrong with it. So, yeah, that's probably as much as I could answer that. <clears throat> to what extent, Jeremy, were you extracting a performance from Michael? And to what extent did you feel he was already there? Um, I was sort of 50-50, I think. I, I, I think Mike worked out early on that, the Rex I wanted to meet, I had in my head already. And Michael, Michael was Rex at the beginning, I reckon, half the time. And half the time I, I had to, re or asked him or reminded him to think about being a more insular person than, than, than perhaps a lot of the characters that Michael plays are. Uh, a more inward looking, a more, more thoughtful and more reserved person. Um, and in many ways, I thought about it as kind of like being being the the X-ray version of of his character from the castle, you know, who's who's <clears throat> an optimist and an, an outward looking person. And this character is kind of ex the exact reverse. He's inward looking, uh, and he's a pessimist. But but he has the same good heart. He has the same really good heart and good judge of what's right and what's wrong. And that's what we wanted to bring out. I mean, it's a lovely moment when he when he tells Tilly's girlfriend that Tilly has a wife and two kids. And you go, oh, wow, this guy has a really strong moral compass and he, he can't let it go. Michael, I'm very keen to get your view on how this film fits in with your formidable list of credits. Your CV is extraordinary. One could easily describe you as a journeyman actor. And I'm wondering whether this performance fits in in any way on a journey that you've been on. Because you can kind of join the dots from Uncle Harry to the castle, to pack, uh, to the rafters, to this. Do you see any sort of sort of linear notion to where uh, the roles you've played with this being like uh, uh, not an end point, but a, a point that you've reached through these characters? Well, look, you know, at 72, you realise you're in the straight and you're not going around again. And I suppose everything you've learned over the years sort of uh, starts to, to bubble up. And then this character seemed to me, um, carrying on from what Jeremy was talking about directing, because what, what Jeremy really did for me is 
is he he any m mannerisms of mine that that he that didn't suit this character he he really jumped on them and uh, that that for me it's what I always used to look for in theatre when I first started acting I'd say you know get on my mannerisms but then people tend to like your mannerisms <laughs> so no one would ever do that and I think Jeremy is the probably the first director who said no I don't want that and pull that back and pull that back and and I suppose I was ready I was really ready for this so when you see a film in a theaterette with a couple of other critics you get a sense a personal sense of whether the film is working or not when you see it with a packed audience you really get a sense of the beating heart of the film Jeremy there's not a false note in this movie and it suggests that the thing has been honed down can you just tell me a bit about <coughs> how carefully crafted the film is or did it all just magically come together in the editing suite uh, the former rather than the latter Jim um, this is my third film and it's a bit of your question you asked before what did you learn on this film well I, I learned over my you know my career but mostly the last three films is that I don't want to go through the drama and hassle and hard work of making a movie again unless everything in it is right and I discovered on, on my first two films that thing, little things that you thought, oh, that's all right, we'll get away with that, or we'll just, that'll be fine, we'll, we'll smooth that over in the edit or something. It's like the princess and the pea, you know, you, you can't sleep and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And when you finish the edit, you just go, oh, I wish we'd fix that. I wish I'd really spent some more time fixing that idea and making it clearer. So Reg and I just worked really, really hard on this script. We had, we had five drafts, we had four rounds of, of development financing from Screen Australia, some from Screen New South Wales. Every time we thought we were nearly ready, we'd look at it, we'd read it, and we'd go, no, we need to do some more work on it. And we had three script editors over the period who brought different you know, ideas to the script. And, and I've become a real structure Nazi in, over this process. And Can you just, for a second, just talk to that issue? Yeah. Because one of the long-standing and continuing issues with Australian film is that you're looking at them and they might look good, the cast might be great, but you really get a sense that the script has not been developed properly. Can you tell me a little bit about your newfound structure Nazism, which is a beautiful phrase? It, it's actually old-fashioned script writing skills. And, and I, I find, I mentioned to people, for instance, that I, I work a lot with Robert McKee's book when I work. And, and a lot of screenwriters will kind of poo-poo it and go, you know what, I, I know better than that. I, I don't work to those structures, man. I'm, I'm, I'm creative, baby. I, you know, I, just, I don't need that stuff. Well, I, personally, I think you need that stuff. And then you can, you can do whatever you like once you understand it. But it's taken me 10 years to really understand three-act structure, simple, basic three-act structure. And this is an absolute classic three-act. We have first act is in Broken Hill, second act's on the road, third act's in Darwin. All the turning points are where they should be when you put a template to it. But because the story was so unique and so strong, I knew that it wouldn't feel like a, you know, colour by numbers script because we already had the story. All I did was shift some of the turning points and things into the places they needed to be to, to elicit responses from an audience. And when we sit in the audience, it's like Pavlov's dog now. People cry and they laugh exactly where they're meant to. And I, I get great satisfaction from that. Now, here's... If I could add something to that too, you've got to remember uh, that this was firstly a play and, uh, and Jeremy was very pedantic in some of the speeches that the meter and rhythm of the speeches were, were just what he wanted. And I think uh, even though uh, Rex hasn't got a lot of dialogue, uh, what I did have... Uh, had to be on that meter so it was a really good exercise to, to be put through actually you don't that doesn't happen a lot yeah. and we're, we're vocally very lazy Australian actors a lot yeah and, and a lot of Australian films you hear the actors go oh no it's going to be more real if I just sort of mumble my way through this and I hate that stuff I, I like to hear what the writers have written is it a fair point to make that the understanding of structure of convention of all those principles of storytelling which some people regard as you know overly structured overly Beneath formulaic them. are actually tools through which you can better express what you want to say in a story yeah the best metaphor is the blues the blues is 12 bars they're the same chords everyone can play them you can play them in five minutes flat and yet you can't be bb king 
because you need to learn that structure backwards so that you can mess with it. And, and that's something that I believe and I've discovered works. If it didn't work, I'd be going, you know what, I should just do whatever I like. But this film is proving to me the more I work on structure, the more it actually pays off for an audience who want to be entertained. They really do. And we set out to entertain an audience, a broad audience with this film. And that was very much in the forefront of our mind when we started. We didn't want to make a niche film. We wanted to tell a story that would move all Australians, and we're hoping that's working. Michael, what does the film say about the issue of euthanasia, do you think? Well, it, it, it doesn't really... It is not really emphatic, I mean, because it, it sort of puts both sides of it. I mean, I think it's one thing to have the right uh, to end your own life, but then it's a, a different thing again to exercise that right because that the life force in people is so strong that, um, you know, people hang on. The beautiful thing about your performance is his growing awareness that he thinks he wants to die, but the journey really teaches him that the important thing is motive. As the doctor says, you need to convince three people the third person being yourself, that you actually want this. And that's really the journey that he goes through. Isn't it? It's, yeah, well yeah. put, Jim. You got it. <laughs> you got it in one. Now, I'm very keen to know what your take was in terms of the, the racial aspects of the yeah. film. Yeah. You have two outstanding performances in this film. You do not shy away in this movie from being critical of urban indigenous culture. There's lack of respect for property. Um, there is drinking. There is also racism from the white side as well. Jeremy, Michael, what's the stance on the racial portrayals in this film? And how do you think it adds to the ongoing cinematic conversation about the portrayal of Indigenous culture in Australian film? Shall I tackle that, Mike? Yeah. yeah it's <laughs> Look, a it's, big one, Jim. And, and it is. It's, the first thing I'd say is that's what we wanted to do. You know, it, it's, it's not by accident that those issues are there and those actors are there. Um, Reg Cribb really is responsible for most of the understanding and the and the the viewpoint on on on, on a love of Aboriginal culture, but also a fear of it being being lost and being subsumed by all of the things around it. Reg Reg wrote Brand New Day. Uh, he's written a play about the Cracker Brothers. He's you know he's worked with Indigenous people for 25 years. Um, we feel like as as white fellas, we can tell a white fella story with black fellas in it and not the other way around. So we wanted to introduce two characters that we have met versions of many times, a strong matriarch um, who doesn't want to be humbugged, who doesn't want to be a part of that kind of, um, that intense family bonding that Aboriginal communities have, but naturally, and also a young, a young man who would have been a prince in any other society who's frustrated by the fact that no one, no one can see his intelligence and his charisma and those things are not leading to the places they would if he was white. Mm. Um, and we also started with the image of, of an old white guy, you know, stale, male and pale, on, a, on the couch with an older black woman holding hands and, and that people would see that as romantic and nothing else. And that was an, uh, that was an objective that we had. All the other issues are in, in there and they're all Aboriginal issues, but we, we didn't want to make it an issue film. We wanted to just tell the story through character. Yeah, Michael... This is the first time, I think, in an Australian film where we've seen a white character and a black character in a romantic oh, yeah. relationship. Uh, is that right? I've never really thought about I've, that. I've thought about it. Yeah. And Reg and I thought about it a lot. And, and we yeah. absolutely wanted to make that. And not only an Aboriginal woman and a, and a white guy, but older mm. people together. Um, and and when, when she walks in the pub you know, and gives them a mouthful... For, because there are white pubs and black pubs still in Broken Hill. Yes. And, and sure, legally, anyone can go anywhere. That, that's, that bridge has been knocked down. But there are plenty of pubs all around Australia where if an Aboriginal person walked in, everyone would stop and look. And likewise, if a white person walked into a couple of Aboriginal pubs around Australia, they'd stop and look too. So that's still there. And, and we set out to do that. Now, you say that you're going for a broad audience. The film, I imagine, though, will skew older. Uh, to that, up until recently, largely neglected part of the demographic. They're not neglected now. The 40, no, they're certainly not. 
I'm just wanting to know, Jeremy Michael, are you happy with the release that this film is getting, given that it's going to be opening against Fantastic Four and Trainwreck? Two very, very you know, high profile American films. How Don't forget Mission Impossible. And that happens. <laughs> you're right. You're going to have the second week of Mission Impossible. How many screens are you opening on? Are you happy with the release of the film? Yeah, I, I'm 220 screens we're, we're coming out on. Um, we're, we're very, I, I can't believe in the film. I think when we started, we thought we might come out on, on 70 to 120 at, at best. And it's really just the response of the cinemas and audiences that we've screened for that's convinced everyone to go this wide. I, I don't think two of those films are going to impact on us at all. Um, yes, our principal audience is, is that, our main demographic is that, but everyone younger that sees our film so far loves it. So we're hoping that word of mouth and, and Facebook and that whole world is working for us because we've done how many screenings, Mike? Like, oh, I've lost count. Like about 30 or 40 screenings now around the country for people. We've been north, <coughs> south, east and west. We have been and everywhere. Centre. Mm. And, and centre. And we do these screenings and people at the end of it, they stay and they talk mm. and they feel like this film speaks to them. Yeah. And we're trusting them to tell their friends, basically. <laughs> I, I, I guess that the sense is that it's such a beautiful film and it's such a strong word of mouth film that opening on fewer screens and then <coughs> growing the release according to the response you get would have been the way to go? Well, it's interesting. That, that was a debate between producers and Icon and people and, and there was a school of thought that, that, that said that. Um, my experience is that the window of release now is, is get shorter and shorter and shorter. And my feeling is that if you open on 50 to 70 screens and say you start to do well, the cinemas have already booked the bigger American projects that are coming back in and you've really got to be going nutty. I mean, to be perfectly honest, for instance, I think Animal Kingdom, which opened on 50, had great word of mouth. Everyone knew it was a great film. I think personally they should have opened on 150 with that film and they would have had a much bigger box office than they did. It's Look, everyone's an expert about this stuff and no one ever gets it right, but we're going wide with, with a lot of word of mouth and we'll see if it works. And what's next for both of you? It's the great unknown, Jim. <laughs> the great unknown. It's called unemployment. <laughs> <laughs> Between engagements. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Michael, does it ever still surprise you just how powerful your performance in The Castle has just carried on? It's now been nearly 20 years. I know, mate. What was it, 97? 97. Yeah, we're, we're getting there for 20 years. My hair was black then. <laughs> <laughs> there was more of it. <laughs> no, mate, no. It's... Uh, it's, it's uh, particularly, uh, you know, if you really think about my work, it's, and it's, it's been Melbourne, Melbourne, Melbourne in terms of, of uh, the, the Sullivans, the castle. Uh, That's true. So yeah. it's, uh, I, I, I've always got a much higher profile in Melbourne than anywhere else. And Jeremy, can I just get a quick observation from you, Michael, please try in if you want to, just about the Australian industry in general, about the quality of films about the connection with audiences how do you think it's going well it's, i mean this is going to be one of those good years in the australian industry and every time there's a good year everyone says look at us we're flying you know as we finally turn the corner and every time there's a bad year everyone says oh my god it's over it's finished i don't think we're just not a big industry right um, the main thing I think that people and press particularly don't acknowledge is that all Australian films that get financed by Screen Australia must be theatrically released. They must, by, uh, contractually. So nine out of ten of those films are not as good as they should be because that's pretty much the general hit rate with movies. And what we forget is that all the films we see from overseas, particularly even the art house ones, they're the best of the best of the best that we get here. We don't get all the other films that they make. So we, we constantly have an Australian audience looking at our films going, why are, they, why are these ones not very good and why did it not stay? It's because I think we release too many of them theatrically and we should have a better a judgment between Screen Australia and distributors to say, well, look, we like your film, but it's not it doesn't play to 200 screens or 50 screens and let's let's market it a different way this film is absolutely a theatrical release film and was meant to be but lots of other films should be should be released in different ways different platforms are you allowed to say how much uh, the budget on this was yeah four four million Jim, you should see Jim's face. <laughs> we made it on the smell of an oily rag Jim the two million of are you was the cost is this of a travel. wind up no no. You made this film for $4 million. Yeah, Greg Duffy and Lisa Duff produced it 
and, and they both have a background working in low budget films. We had a crew of 35. We had one gaffer, one grip and one swing man between the gaffer and the grip and, a, and a, we didn't have a, a lighting truck, we had a lighting van. Um, you know, Steve Arnold, who shot the film, did an incredible job. Didn't he just? Uh, didn't well, he? The cinematography in this film is yeah. outstanding. He, he had one in... 5K and two 2Ks, and that was it. <laughs> we had to move them for every setup. Um, Sorry, he... that's a shock. That's a genuine shock. Oh, Sorry, I'm still reacting. The cinematography in the film is beautiful. Not just the outside shots, the standard, not standard, but the, no. the, the, the expected landscape shots. Mm. It's when the camera goes inside inside your room when it's looking inside the mm. cab, inside the hotel rooms, inside the pubs, you've put detail in there that makes it look like it's a period film. Yep. It all looks very, very carefully yep. placed. I worked very closely with Clayton Jauncey, the production designer, and, and uh, we, we didn't want to set the film specifically in a year. It's an allegorical film. It, it's not a true story. It's a nearly true story. And so we wanted to put it somewhere in the past, in the olden days, look, 20 years ago. Um, but we didn't want to then have to digitally remove any truck that was in the wrong year and all that stuff. And, and we wanted it to be, a, a, you know, it's a bit of a fairy tale. Um, so I'm really pleased with that look. And, and really, I just can't sing Steve Arnold's praises enough for insisting every time we were in a location. And I'd say, we can't afford that. We don't have time for that. And he would push, push, push to get those lights moved. Um, our gaffer didn't stop moving stuff around. Yeah. And, and he said, we can make this look like a great, expensive film if we really just try to do it. And we had a brilliant crew and we worked really hard to get that look.